continuing educational series. Um, the Holden AgCom was created about seven or eight years ago to promote agriculture in Holden. Uh, education is one of the tasks that we took on when we uh, started that activity. And this event tonight is in a quarter, is a sort of a, one of a quarterly series of things that we've been doing for the last three or four years. Uh, we did a, a number of presentations on things like raising chickens and your backyard and goats in the backyard and how to preserve your land for future generations. Uh, most recently, we did uh, a series on uh, pruning fruit trees and soil chemistry, and this, this follows up with the season of, of uh, vegetables and so on being ready to uh, uh, produce and, and how to get the most out of them throughout the year. Uh, all, a good number of these presentations have been recorded, and they're linked to YouTube videos through our Facebook page. Uh, which you can find through Facebook directly, or there's a link from the Holden AgCom website to uh, help you get there. Tonight's presenter is Heidi Cooper. Uh, Heidi has been involved in agriculture literally her whole life. Uh, she has done food preservation f in various forms, both for herself and professionally over a good number of years. She currently works for the Davidian Brothers Farm uh, in Northboro and also part-time for Lilac Hedge Farm here in Holden. She's also a director of the Worcester County Farm Bureau and uh, a president of the Young Farmers and Ranchers subgroup of the Massachusetts Farm Bureau, which is a, a full-time job in itself. Uh, YFNR specializes in educating and mentoring young farmers and helping them get started and, and continue uh, farms throughout the, throughout the state. In her spare time, she takes care of two small children and, and when she sleeps, I have no idea. Heidi. Thank you, Jim. Good evening. I want to first of all thank the Agricultural Commission here for inviting me to do this presentation um, and of course to the Senior Center for donating the, the space that is here. Um, a quick bit more of an introduction of myself and then what we'll go over tonight. Um, so this is more of a presentation than a hands-on type of um, class. With that, uh, if you are new to canning, preserving, haven't done any of this before, do not be afraid to try it for the first time within your own home. Um, if you have any questions, concerns, anything like that, I do have my card here with me and the internet is a, a wonderful uh, plethora of resources. Um, in addition, if you are not familiar with different ways of canning and you're not comfortable with using the internet, um, the libraries are wonderful resources. So I actually own a couple canning and preserving books myself that I absolutely love. Um, if you like using uh, you know, your online resources, that is perfectly acceptable too, but there are a good number of books within the library system in Massachusetts. I have about 15 of them checked out right now myself, um, but they'll be going back in. So if you're not comfortable with canning and preserving, whether it be the first topic we'll talk about, which is lacto-fermentation, um, if you're not comfortable with freezing foods properly, if you're not comfortable with drying foods properly, or even canning, water bath and pressure canning, there are resources that I have here tonight and you can take a look at. And if it's something that you would like to either purchase or rent from the library, you can certainly take down notes and do so. Um, aside from that, I also have a couple of resources I brought with me. So the main Thing we'll really focus on this evening is safety and with that um, the the guidelines that are uh, put forward by the USDA um, I have some notes from the Center for Disease Control as well the CDC the Food and Drug Administration but there is a single resource online that is wonderful for everything the most up-to-date information on how to safely preserve your foods it's the National Center for Home Food Preservation so I brought some of that information tonight. So you can either access that at home online or if you would like to purchase a paper copy because you're more comfortable with that, I have those details here with me. Um, so as we go through the slides this evening, if you have any questions, keep them. We can go ahead and take care of them at the end. Um, as a first mention, I brought a whole bunch of tools and things here with me that I happen to have in my home but I want you to know that the basics of canning and preserving doesn't take much for excess supplies. I happen to have more because it makes it more convenient, 
but it doesn't mean that you need these things to be able to do the basics. Um, so with that in mind, we'll get started with the first of the four uh, topics that we will start with or that we'll talk about. So like I said, we'll talk about lacto-fermentation, we will talk about freezing, we'll talk about drying, and then also canning, primarily water bath canning, but also a quick touch on pressure canning. So those are the four main areas that we're going to hit this evening. So with that in mind, the first topic is lacto-fermentation, which is the process of using bacteria to transform your vegetables. So why it works. The process in itself works because the bacteria that can harm us doesn't do well in salt. While healthy bacteria, bacteria can. Lacto-fermentation knocks out the bad guys in the first stage and then lets the good guys thrive in the second step. So what does that mean, lacto-fermentation? Lactobacillus is the bacteria that converts sugars naturally present in produce into lactic acid. The acid is a natural preservative and it preserves the flavor and texture of food as well as its nutrients. The acid creates a lower pH in the in environment and that's what destroys the harmful bacteria and creates a safe environment for the food that you're eating. The live bacteria help your digestive system, are believed to have anti-inflammatory properties as well. I'm sure you've seen the yogurt commercials and all of that about the active cultures that are good for your gut health. These are one of those active bacterias. So with that, I um, started, this is actually a sauerkraut that I just started today, so it's brand new, but I wanted to show you how easy it was to do something within, within all of this. So to be able to do lacto-fermentation, the supplies are very basic. Um, having a container such as a wide mouth mason jar as I have here, or anything else that's taller than it is wide works just fine. Um, if you want to really get into frequently fermenting foods, if it's something that you want to be able to um, just do with more ease, you can also purchase a crock, which is that first item here. Basically, the way that the crocks work, there are weights that hold the food down while the air bubbles are able to come up to the top, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. The other thing that's needed is a weight that fits inside your crock or whatever canister you are fermenting your foods in. So as an example, today I started this. This is about a half of a head of a large cabbage. I shredded it up, added salt. We'll talk about the steps a little bit more, but what you need to do with your foods as you have them here, as you can see or maybe can't see, the cabbage that's in this jar is coming to the top of the liquid for it to be safely preserved in that lactic acid that's below the surface. All the food needs to stay under the water it allows the air bubbles to be released as the fermentation is happen happening and that's what keeps it safe. So you can buy online, they have all sorts of things you can use to put on top of the jars to keep the food safe. You can also use most anything in your home that is sanitary to hold it down. So a lot of folks will use a secondary mason jar that fits on top. So for this one at home, as I have it sitting on my counter, I would use a, like a four ounce uh, mason jar just set on top the weight in itself might be enough to keep the food down if not you can add you know a couple pebbles or something like that within the jar but so like I said you don't need anything extra special there are tools that will help you make it a little simpler like the crock or even if you see in the middle picture here there are um, airlocks that you can purchase so you can screw loads on top of your jar keeps a little bit of liquid within, but it lets the air bubbles be released safely while guaranteeing that your food is not coming out of the water bath itself. So the process, like I mentioned, so I did this earlier today, it will be ready for me to eat probably within three days. Um, with that being said, the food that you preserve using lacto-fermentation is safe to use at any part of the process. If I wanted to go ahead and eat this now because I was impatient, it's perfectly safe to eat. The flavor just has not yet been developed. So you wash and chop or slice your vegetables and obtain your jar. When you're preserving food, whether it's this or any other method, always follow a recipe. Um, if nothing else tonight, the most important thing I want to stress is that you don't have to know exactly what you're doing, but if you have a good recipe from a reliable source, whether it be one of the publications at the library, um, through one of the websites like the canning jar companies, um, Ball and things like that, or even the extension services through universities, 
if you find a recipe you like in whichever method you like, just follow it to a T because they've been tested and trialed for acid levels and that is indeed what makes them safe. So following the recipe instructions, go ahead and put together the produce, which in this case was just green cabbage, salt that I sprinkled in between as I was doing it in the uh, amount that was indicated in the recipe. I think it was uh, two tablespoons for this jar and the quantity I was using. Assemble and then make sure that your food stays under the brine. So if you're using any water in your recipes, perhaps you need to add water and salt together. Um, cabbage happens to hold a lot of liquid. So as I was adding salt to this and pressing it down, it actually released enough liquid in itself. I didn't have to add any water. If that hadn't been the case, the recipe indicated that I could add a water salt solution. If you want to do that, make sure you are using a filtered, non-chlorinated water. Um, if you're using regular town water, tap water, things like that, they can um, hold chemicals and chlorine in them that can uh, prohibit the positive bacteria growth within your food. So as my recipe said, you keep the jar at room temperature for as long as it calls for. Um, it could be a day or two. In warmer temperatures, it will go faster. So a lot of times, I'll mention this a bit in the future as well, but when you're preserving foods like this, it happens to be root vegetables. So a lot of people use lacto-fermentation for cabbages, carrots, radishes, and things like that. And not only is it because they do well, but it's also because the season lends itself to that. The um, cabbage and carrots and things like that are available in the spring and in the fall when it's less likely to be really hot outside. With that speedier heat, the, um, you need more salt to keep your bacteria levels down. So usually, on kind of like the weather we've had in the last couple of days here, that you know, 60s, 70s is a really beneficial temperature to be making, making your brines at. So once the fermentation actually begins, you'll see the bubbles come up from the liquid. It starts to develop a bit of a, a smell. If you've had real sour pickles, you would know what that smells like. So it's a sour, but it's a clean smell. Remember, um, with that, if it's something that smells off to you, and this isn't any of the methods, if, if something doesn't look right to you and you're not sure, don't consume it. There's no, um, there's no good way to go about that. So if you're unsure, simply you know call it a loss on that jar and try again. Um, I've failed many times myself, actually one of the first times I did sauerkraut, so don't feel bad about, a, about something that doesn't go quite right. Um, but so in any event, depending on what your recipe says, continue with how long the fermentation is supposed to take. Once it has been underway for a few days, you can transfer the jar to your refrigerator. So when you put it in that cold climate, it doesn't completely halt the fermentation, but it does cease it a little bit and it lets it, um, it just, it keeps it safer for a longer period of time. So as recommended by your recipe that follows, you know, USDA guidelines, all of those things, once it's in your refrigerator, your recipe will tell you how long it is good for, but it's normally, uh, you know, a handful of weeks all the way up to four to six months, as long as it is in a, in a controlled climate. Um, so as I mentioned before, with these foods, they're safe to eat at any stage, but they won't have developed flavors if you eat them too soon or in the first couple of days. The longer you let them sit, the, the more flavor that they will develop. And if you really find a recipe you like, you'll find out within the stage of its growth where you really like that. So maybe you really enjoy making a sauerkraut, but it really takes about two weeks for the flavor really to develop. Um, as I mentioned, the hotter the environment, the most, more salt you may need, because remember the salt is what's killing that bad bacteria in the beginning. So like that's uh, why we use the, the cold weather crops a lot of times and happen to do it during the fall. When uh, in the refrigerator, the food will, will uh, ferment slower, but as we said, it will keep fermenting. Um, as the FDA does recommend only refrigerator storage to be appropriate location for food safety. Um, you also can can your fermented foods. So if you ended up making too much, whatever it may be, you can use a water bath canning method we'll talk about later, but normally folks are using lacto-fermentation because of the bacterias, the beneficial bacterias that it provides, and this would kill those. So would kind of, you know, ruin, ruin the original goal. Um, aside from that, if a mold or a scum develops on the top of your ferment, it isn't something you have to worry about just in this particular type of preserving. As long as your food is underneath your brine in that salt water solution, your food is still safe. Um, do pay attention to your nose. So if it turns from that pleasant sour smell to something that really maybe you wouldn't want to smell again, 
it's likely that your pH wasn't quite right. Something went wrong, so you might want to go ahead and try that one again. Um, so the second method we will talk about this evening is dehydration. This and freezing are actually my two favorite types of preserving, um, simply because you can do a whole bunch with them. You don't need a lot of knowledge, and it's just they're, they're easy. So all it does is take away the moisture from foods to prolong its shelf life. So why does it work? There are no bacteria, yeast, or molds that are able to survive the absence of moisture. So that's why it makes dried food safe. Dehydrating food also slows down enzyme activity, although it does not eliminate it. Dehydrated foods will never taste like they're formerly fresh shelves once they're reconstituted. So if you're going to dehydrate cantaloupe slices or tomatoes for a stew or something like that, They'll never come back to be exactly what they were to start, but if you really um, enjoy dehydrated fruits, like I know my kids really like banana chips and things like that, we use the actual dried foods and snacks a lot of the time, um, but additionally in soups and stews and things like that in the winter. Um, nutritionally, they hold up very well. They do lose vitamin C. That's one thing you can lose a lot of, um, but other things like uh, vitamin A, B, fiber, and most of your minerals do, do stick around. Um, so to dehydrate, Honestly, all you need is what you likely already have in your home, which is an oven and a baking sheet to put items on. If you want to really get into dehydration, want it to be easier so that you're leaving um, things for a longer period of time, don't have to check on them as much, flip them over, you can also purchase a commercial dehydrator. Um, so as I said, a baking sheet covered in parchment paper does just fine with your own home oven. If you happen to have a convection oven, that's even better just because it circulates the air a little bit more. Um, but if it's something that you really enjoy, like I have purchased a nine tray dehydrator myself, an Excalibur version, and I absolutely love it. It's something that we use quite a bit in my house to make jerky and um, fruit roll-ups. My daughter is going into kindergarten this upcoming week, and she wanted to have healthy lunches packed for her. So on top of, you know, we're very lucky we have our garden so she can take cucumbers and tomatoes. Um, but on top of that, being able to make fruit roll-ups some, was something that I just did for the first time a week and a half ago, and I brought a little uh, sample to view of that. But in any event, if you're interested in dehydration, all you need is your oven. If you would like to do more with it, there are other supplies you can get to be able to do more, more frequently with a little bit more ease. So the process in general for dehydration, you wash, chop, and slice your vegetables or this also can be used for other foods um, like meat and things like that, but this is more focused just on produce. So follow your recipe instructions and prepare just as they say. If you need to blanch your food, which we'll talk about in just a bit, I have some um, examples actually up here of some blanched items. Um, you would go ahead and do that before you dry them. Make sure that they are after they're cooked in a hot water. So blanching is simply cooking briefly in boiling water um, to either maintain their texture, color, um, or remove skins for some things like peaches and tomatoes. Um, but you stop the cooking by inserting into an ice bath, drain, and make sure that they're all dry, ready to go ahead and dehydrate. So you put them either on your drying sheet or your rack, whatever it is that you're using, and just make sure when placing them on there that they're not touching. So if you're doing something like apple slices, um, you don't wanna pile them on top of each other and impede their ability to dry out evenly. Um, so making sure that that is not happening. Also, if you want to use parchment paper, that is perfectly fine. We do a lot of it in our house. So I have these silicone mats that work excellent. They fit directly on the dehydrator model that I have, which is why I purchased these. But these could also be used in an oven um, and they can be used for baking and things too. They don't have to be just for drying and people use these for cookies and all sorts of things like that. So again, another great thing you can have, but not necessary, especially if you're new to drying, certainly not uh, necessary to do the original investment. Um, so go ahead and set your dehydrator to the appropriate temperature. Your recipe will always tell you what that key temperature is. If you're using the oven, it'll usually have you set it to the lowest temperature that your oven can do, normally around 170, depending on the food. Um, and then additionally, because the benefit of uh, having the dehydrator machine itself, especially the ones that are stacked with the heating unit in the back, is that it's blowing the hot air through, it hits all of the levels evenly, and it's able to let the moisture out. The one thing to keep in mind with an oven is that you're not able to let that moisture out because your oven holds it in. 
So if you're going to use an oven, you can use like a wet dish cloth um, just to hold it because the oven temperature is so low. It's something that's safe enough to do just a little bit so that your moisture can escape as the food is steaming so it doesn't hold that in and keep your items um, a bit a bit soppy. So different foods show different signs of doneness. A lot of times your recipe will indicate like if you're drying Roma tomatoes or whatever it may be, there are certain like bend tests you can do to see how much um, moisture they still hold. Um, once you're ready to go ahead and put them away, make sure that you let them come fully to room temperature. Don't rush it. Don't put them in the refrigerator. Um, just let them come to temperature on the counter before you seal them in your bag so that no moisture is kept. Because if they are still warm, they're still going to be letting off moisture and then you would be trapping moisture in your container and likely use the product that you started to dry. So a couple things to know or tips and tricks. So of course you can do just slices of fruit. Like I actually, so these, are, these aren't even completely done because around 11 this morning, I was like, I should like take some examples. So I put these in the oven, they're not quite done, so I brought them, I'm just gonna eat them for dinner anyway. But they, um, so these are ones I did in my oven. Apples, you can usually just tell by texture. Um, and it can, be a, it can be a personal preference too. If you don't like an, a dried apple or an apple chip that is really brittle, you don't have to dry it as much. You just have to be careful about how you store it. If something is extremely dry, you can put it in a bag, put it in your pantry, a mason jar, and not worry about it. If you don't want them to be um, as hard, like my daughter doesn't like really crunchy apple chips, but I want her to be able to take them to school, I will keep them in the refrigerator. Even though they've been dried, putting them in the fridge prolongs their shelf life. So I can put them in the fridge, but then know if we take them out, whether it's going to school, or even if we go on a camping trip for the weekend, they'll be fine for the few days. So we go around that a little bit like that. Um, so the other couple of things, you can also dry meats. Like I have done beef jerky, either with lean cuts or um, even with ground beef. The biggest thing to make sure a lot of times your recipe will indicate low fat is very important because uh, fat goes rancid. And on top of that, making sure that you're hitting the, the temperature. So the biggest thing is making sure that you heat the meat to over, you want the internal temperature to hit at least 260 degrees. So even after drying on your sheet, when you put it in there at 145 degrees, whether it's your oven or your, um, or your actual dehydrator, they want you to finish it in the oven to make sure that there's no chance of any bacteria still living. So that is something that's recommended um, by, by the FDA. Um, if you're doing dried fruits, like so in our area, because Massachusetts is so big on cranberries, I love drying my own cranberries. You can, um, I guess the biggest benefit to that, I like using maple sugar on mine instead of regular white sugar. It just adds a different flavor. So in that, it's the only way I can find them, cranberries and maple sugar, it's really good on Thanksgiving. Um, but so something to help break the skin so that the moisture is able to be released when you're drying it, it's called checking. So basically, it's like blanching. You put the, uh, put the fruit in boiling water until the skin splits and bring it out and then go ahead and dry it as normal. But that way, the, even when it's trying to dry out, it's able to escape the skins like grapes and cranberries have. Um, and then lastly, if you don't mind darkening, like I didn't treat these apples at all and they, they will continue to brown now because they're not fully dried. If you don't mind the brownness that happens, you don't have to use any sort of additives to keep that from happening. Um, but if you would rather them keep their color, things like this with fruit, you can use a myriad of things. Um, for example, so lemon juice, which is something you might have, citric acid, which is what I have here and I personally use, um, and then ascorbic acid and things like that. So within your recipe, it'll tell you what is um, appropriate to use. The reason I choose to use citric acid is that I was able to buy a lot of it and it just sits in my pantry and I always have it because I run out of things like lemon juice. But aside from that, I also do cheese making and citric acid is necessary for mozzarella. So in my house, it's kind of a win-win, something that I always want to have. All right, the last thing, and I'll be really quick about this, for air drying, air drying is wonderful, especially if you have herbs, um, flowers, which is non-food at all, or even things like beans and peppers. You can simply air dry in your home, which is very easy. So like the green beans on the bottom left-hand side, long, long time ago, they were called leather britches. And it was just stringing up your green beans. You can take a needle and go straight through it on your, you know, whatever, um, thicker um, type of, I don't know, say twine. 
I don't know, like cotton yarn, um, and put it through and just let them air dry. You always want to make sure when you're air drying, not in the sun. Like I tried, I have a space in my pantry I'm able to do it. So it keeps it away from drafts and things like that. My kids and my dogs, because you don't want them messing with things. Um, but so dried green beans are an example of something you can dry in the air. Um, ristras, which are the beautiful chilies that hang, um, that are actually edible and you can do things with. So if you end up, if you're in a CSA and you have too many chili peppers or whatever it may be, um, they do wonderful. A lot of times it's hot peppers as opposed to sweet simply because they're smaller, they dry better. Um, so that's why you usually see hot peppers as part of ristras. And then herbs, so just string them up. Usually just use a, you know, a couple sprigs together. I recommend using a rubber band, only because if you try to do something pretty with like twine, they get smaller when they dehydrate and then they fall out. So it's just uh, something I've learned the hard way. Um, another thing that really helps out, and I actually learned this, I did a similar workshop a few weeks ago and the woman said that in her house she puts a paper bag around the herbs because she just does small bunches but she has a bunch of dogs and she didn't want any chance of anything settling on it or if she forgets about it for an extra couple of weeks. So using paper bags because they let the air through is something that was a great tip from her. So I'm gonna start doing that for myself. All right, so two down, two to go. The third one, freezing, is my absolute favorite. And it's my favorite because I have little kids and I am now lucky I have a larger kitchen, but for the first four years I was married, my kitchen was very small. I didn't wanna have all the space for the canning supplies or the hot water. Um, so I invested in some freezers. So in our cellar, we have um, two stand-up freezers. I prefer the stand-up freezers to chest freezers, although chest freezers are more economical um, with being able to, uh, electricity and things like that. Being able to get to stuff was really important to me because I do a large variety of items. Uh, but so anyway, freezing is my favorite and it's so easy and it's a lot more foolproof than other things. So like I said, very, very easy. It can be much faster, um, more dependable, and it takes a lot of questions out of the mix. The one con, of course, as I put here at the bottom, is the long-term energy use because you're keeping it in that freezer that's on. If you have a power outage, just hope that your freezer was really full because it'll keep itself cold, which I have learned before and was wonderful. Um, but on top of all of that, like I said, the biggest thing is just ease, especially with me having little kids in my, in my house. My oldest now is five, so it's easier to keep them away. But when I was working in a small space, just dealing with blanching and hot water and things like that, I wasn't, I wasn't ready to deal with. Um, the one thing I mentioned on here, I have an example afterwards, if anyone wants to touch a tomato, um, I actually use freezing still as a step, even when I'm canning tomato sauce. So the other day I was leaving work at Davidians in Northboro, they're big fruit and vegetable growers, and they have a lot of waste product from, you know, nicks and things like that on tomatoes that can't even be donated because within a day they start to, you know, break down. So I was leaving work and going by this like load of tomatoes and just, I couldn't leave them. Like there's just something about me I couldn't, I couldn't not save a couple of them. So anyway, I brought home two, I think I took home about 80 pounds of tomatoes. My husband was like, okay, but I didn't have the time to do anything with it right away. So all we did, well, we did a little bit right away, but so we cleaned them off, got rid of any that were, you know, not great, cleaned out the bad spots, you know, cored them, as you can see here, and then put them in the freezer. So I actually took these out of the freezer right before I came, and the reason I did that is because it's a cheat way to get the skins off of your tomatoes really fast in big quantities. So some people might not be interested in that because you're freezing them and then cooking them. So it does change the nutritional profile. I will be honest about that. In our house, it was just a choice I made because it was fast. So my husband and I each took our you know, big box of tomatoes, cored them, cleaned them. I mean, it you know, probably took 40 minutes in total. But now I have these two big boxes in my basement because my freezers aren't full yet that are frozen. I'll bring them upstairs in the next couple days whenever I get to it and just put them in frozen form in my large stock pot let them start to thaw and then I'll get messy and I'll go in with my hands and just start to pull out the peels. You can also put them through a food mill, which I have, if you wanna bring out the peels that way, but it's just, it's a fun thing for my kids to do too. Like I let them go for it and you know, they learned all about food safety, wash your hands and all those things. Um, but it really shortens the process for me. It makes it longer by days, but in actual active time, it saves me a ton of time. Cause when you're blanching, like I said, we'll get to some of this nitty stuff right at the end. But when you're blanching, you're only supposed to be doing a small number because you have to put them into boiling water, wait that 30 seconds or whatever the, you know, the guidelines call for for that particular product. 
ice bath it and then keep going. So with the number that we had, this was faster, easier, and kind of a, a cheat that I found. It's also really neat if you happen to bring home either stores, you know, from the farmer's market, wherever it may be, you end up with ones that you think they're not gonna make it, you're not gonna get to them, but you don't wanna throw them away, just put them in your freezer. Cause you can compile amount of them and then eventually just take them and make a sauce instantly the same night. So pull them out of your freezer, put them in a pot, you know, earlier in the day, and then cook them down, pull the peels out, and you have a sauce instantly. So that's a way to easily save some tomatoes if they're on the brink of going. Um, so actually freezing, very easy. Really all you need is a baking sheet or materials to put in. You can also just take your cherries and put them in a freezer bag, take the air out and put them in the freezer and be done with them after you clean them. Um, to make it easy, I always recommend as much as possible for things like um, slices of fruit, cherries and items like that is being able to, if you have the space, freeze them originally on a baking sheet so that they're individually frozen and then adding them to your bag. Um, the biggest thing is just being able to remove the air. So if you want to be able to do that professionally, I mean, maybe if you buy, you know, large packs of meat and break it down or, if, you know, buy a whole or quarter cow and want to be able to break things down a bit more, you might be interested in buying a food saver or something, but it's not necessary. A freezer bag, with a straw so you can just suck out the air at the end works perfectly fine especially I mean by the time we freeze cherries and we use them in the first couple months because um, we use them for Thanksgiving and that so the supplies are very very minimal as long as you have the freezer space so the process in general blanching so many foods can go into the freezer raw as I mentioned the cold temperature slows down the enzymes that are produced that make it deteriorate um, fruit in particular that has natural acids can be sliced and frozen without no additional prep. Um, but low acid vegetables will benefit from a blanching should you choose to do so. Um, things especially like asparagus and that do, do well with a blanching first. So like I said, for blanching, it's simply bringing your water to a boil, putting the food in the water for whatever period of time is indicated for that food, and then taking it out and putting it into a water bath. Um, you don't need anything special to do a blanching, a slotted spoon to take the items out, or tongs if it happens to be something like asparagus. If you want to make things easier on yourself, you can get something like this that you're inserting into the pot to easily just grab and pull it out. Uh, but again, it's just a convenience, makes things easier. With my uh, five-year-old starting to do some of this stuff with me, this was actually a new purchase for me just a few weeks ago because she wanted to be able to do the peaches with me and I didn't want her using a spoon and dumping them out. So she is using this with me. Um, so aside from that, like I said, individual freezing is great because you get them fully frozen. You can put them in the baggie after because they don't have moisture when they're entering the bag because it's been fully frozen. Um, they don't stick together as much unless you have a powder out power outage and they thaw a bit. Um, but otherwise, you can just dip your hand into the bag, the container, whatever it may be. It's perhaps you're freezing your items in a mason jar. You can, of course, freeze in glass and things like this. But that way you are able to pull out exactly what it is you want, the quantity you want, without having to thaw an entire quart bag and maybe not using it. Um, the other neat thing I think a lot of people don't realize is you can make really easy freezer jam without having to cook anything. So they make all sorts of pectin which we'll mention in a little bit. But if you want to be able to just mash up your fruit, mix in your sugar and something to help it thicken and then freeze it, you can do that. So this is my only used once um, version from home. But so as, as an example with that, so you choose your fruit, whether it's strawberry, peaches, um, raspberries, cherries, and right on the label, it tells you exactly what your recipe is. So if you're not sure about what to use, again, you can go right on their website. So like Ball has a wonderful food preservation website of recipes that you can trust and live by, but right on the label, it reminds you exactly what you need. So for example, if you wanted to use, to do strawberry jam, you mash up your strawberries, you need one and two, uh, two thirds cups, the amount of sugar that it calls for, which is two thirds of a cup, and then two tablespoons of the pectin. You mash it up. Um, you put it, the sugar and pectin in a bowl, stir in your fruit, mash it up, wait three minutes, you ladle it into jars, and then it goes into the freezer. And that's how easy it is. So again, it takes up freezer space, but it's a lot easier to be able to take that item right out and enjoy it right away. Um, and then the last thing is, it doesn't have to be just like fruits and vegetables that you're freezing. So one of my favorite things to freeze is caramelized onions and mushrooms, like a mix. 
So I suckered my husband into spending like 30 minutes chopping up a bunch of tomatoes last fall, or not, excuse me, chopped a bunch of onions last fall because I wanted to do this and it worked out really well. So I cooked them down in my crock pot overnight. So I did the um, onions on the bottom first, put mushrooms over that, a um, little bit of moisture. Uh, so I think maybe like a half a cup just to make sure that the bottom was coated, put in mushrooms, let it cook overnight and we woke up in the morning. It was mostly full down. I did a quick stir, let it go a little bit longer and I had onions and mushrooms because we love them on burgers. So then I was able from that just to put them in, you know, small, um, small quantities, froze them in the freezer bags and they were ready to go. So now we can do like neat, fancy burger nights and have all the cool toppings without having to make, you know, the caramelized onions and mushrooms all the time. So there's other things you can think outside of the box or even just, I'm sure, you know, have frozen leftovers from Thanksgiving and things like that. So, you know, roasted tomatoes, all of those things. Just the one thing is to make sure that you leave the headspace. Anytime you freeze, science, there's expansion. So you always want to leave about a half inch at the top of your jars or whatever it may be for that up to 10% expansion. Um, so this, oh sorry, it didn't format over that well. But so as an example, and I have a copy of this too if anyone needs or it's easy to search online. But if you are going to be blanching, there's guidelines that are set for how much time you should blanch things for. So if you don't want to do something because you're not sure, you can look it up very easily. And if you are using one of the preservation books, it will tell you that. So for example, um, I froze a couple bushel of corn in the last few weeks. So I would use the whole ear of corn um, and blanched it, took it out, cooled it down, all of that, and then cut it off, um, cut it off to put in the, in the freezer. A lot of these things, like I said, you can do without blanching, but just preserve the, a little bit more of the texture, the color, the enzymes, things like that. Um, blanching is a, something that is a good thing to do in advance. I have frozen full ears of corn without anything. It just, it was okay, but it wasn't what I, you know, it wasn't what I loved. And I really like taking it out in kernels to just make corn cakes or whatever it may be. So you'll find your own preferences with, you know, how you want to do these things. All right, so the last one, the one that I think people are usually most scared of is water bath canning. And there's nothing nothing at all scary about it. Every single water bath canning recipe is, is a recipe. So as long as you can follow the recipe to a T, there is nothing you have to worry about. So in normal life, I don't follow a recipe for anything. If we make dinner, whatever it may be, I don't ever remember. We never eat the same dinner twice because I don't, I just, I, I don't recipe. I try to use exactly what we have in the house, throw in extra stuff. It always has cheese. Um, but so water bath canning is one thing that I do follow the recipe to a T because making sure that you have all of the things like headspace, your acidity level, um, and those things that we will talk about are important to making sure that to be a shelf stable item to sit either, you know, in your pantry or cellar that you're following these things to destroy bacteria and prolong your shelf life. So why does it work? The standard way to provide long shelf stability is this boiling water method that we will talk about. And it can be done with foods that are, uh, a pH of 4.6 or lower. So don't worry, you do not have to know what the acidity of your food is because the recipe, if you're using a tried and true recipe, it's already below that. If you ever get so advanced that you want to make your own canning recipes, you can do like pH meters, it's something you can purchase and utilize. Um, but in the beginning, as long as you're following using the proper foods, the measurements that are in the recipe, you are good to go. And if, you are, if your recipe is calling to water bath can, you are below that 4.6 level. Um, so with that, you use specially measured acid levels that provide a safe, at, safe atmosphere for the food to be heated, just right to kill the bacteria. All of these things together with being submerged in water so that the vapor can escape um, are exactly what makes all of this safe. So once you put your foods in the jars that are in the water bath, and we'll go into a bit, a bit more detail on that, you take them out, you let them sit. So that's one of the hardest things about doing a, like a canning uh, like a workshop is that even if your group gets together and you can you know let's say tomato sauce they really shouldn't be moved after you've canned them so you take them out you set them on towels on the counter like moving them around to take them home in a car is just not it's not a good idea for seal safety and things like that um, but so once you remove them from the water um, you set them on the counter and then as the food cools from that boiling temperature that was uh, put throughout the jars the cooling food contracts and that's what results in the negative pressure that sucks down your canning lid. Um, so when you are, and this is because this is not a canned product, this is my in the middle of lacto-fermentation. 
when you're using a jar, um, a regular canning jar, before it is sealed, you can hear the little, the little pop that it makes. After it's properly sealed, just like the jars that you open from the grocery store, that is compressed down, as is mentioned here, because of that negative pressure, it sucks it down, and that's how you know that you have your airproof safe seal. So supplies, a lot of the stuff is unnecessary. The main things that you need are the canning jars themselves, which you can get like anywhere, and used canning jars are just fine. If you find a score of a yard sale, which I have done, as long as you have, uh, they're able to be fully clean and sanitized, your canning jars can be given from anyone, any kind, um, and that's perfectly fine. The screw bands themselves that are on top, so for canning, it's a two-piece canning lid. The screw bands can be reused as long as they're treated well. Um, my mom always told me not to put stuff in the dishwasher and I don't listen a lot and I do listen about this now because they will start to rust. Um, unless you want to be able to throw them out and purchase more. But so if you take care of your screw bands, just you know, wash them, dry them, put them in a Ziploc bag when they're not being used. These can be reused as well. The one thing that is necessary to be brand new every time that you are canning is the actual lid itself. And the reason with that is because they have around the rim here their little, um, it's like a, a rubber that is flexible when it's heated up. It's what helps make that safe seal on the lid. So if you reuse a jar, it doesn't have the same um, structural integrity and is likely that your food will not um, seal safe. So anytime you're canning, I always have like a bunch of my extra lids uh, because it's not something you can go without. And this is only for the water bath canning. So if you're putting them in jars to freeze them, or you're just putting your dehydrated apples in the pantry, that's fine. But if you're looking for that seal to be shelf stable, you need to be using brand new lids every time. Um, the other basic materials, you need to be able to get your hot jars out of the water. So a jar lifter is something that is rather specific that is very handy to have. Um, I have a friend that had doctored up something else as well, but if, if you want to be you know as safe as possible, these are easy, and I think they're like, for especially this time of year, if you don't have these supplies and you're looking for them, go to Tractor Supply or Target or wherever, and they're all discounted. Like I was at uh, Tractor Supply a couple weeks ago and like couldn't find this because I'm pretty sure it's upstairs in my kid's toy room, and so I just bought an extra because it was 99 cents. Um, so a lot of these materials, especially right now, because it's, you know, kind of getting to the, the end of summer are on sale and you can easily find them. Um, but so this is very important just so you have a safe way. It's rubberized so it helps you grab your jars and lift them with ease and all of that. It keeps you all safe. Um, and then your pot. So if you happen to have, like I, I own a pressure canner as well, so I use this pot for my water bath canning just as like a normal pot, but you don't have to have anything special. As long as your canner is large enough to hold your jars and keep them secure, and then either an insert, which I think there's a picture up there. Um, you can see it peeking out on the right-hand side, The basically the thing that keeps your jars off the bottom of the pot. Um, if you buy an actual canning set, the pot, the thing, you can get all of this in a little kit and it will make everything very easy for you but if you don't want to go that go that route I actually broke my canner um, and bought these on Amazon a few months ago and they're just their pot inserts so I put one in the bottom and it keeps them <laughs> off the bottom because the rattling of the glass can break them aside from that you don't want them directly on the bottom because it's too much exposure directly with the heat and you want the uh, water to be able to flow underneath it and so I have these it's nice to also have two of them because when you are either water bath canning or pressure canning, you can stack your jars as long as they're small enough. So I do it with jelly jars, like the little four ounce jelly jars. Do this as the in-between so that I can do a second level. As long as you have enough water over them, you have to have at least three inches of water over the top of your jars. Um, or so, Sorry, three inches of full space, two inches of water, and then an inch because when your water's bubbling, you don't want it bubbling over. But so these are very useful and I'm pretty sure about $8 on Amazon. Um, you can also use a cookie rack if you happen to have a round, like a cake drying, cookie drying, anything like that. It works just fine, just so your jars aren't touching the bottom. Uh, but the rest of the stuff, you can just use things you have at home. So like this is a wonderful tool. I'll grab a couple of these. They're neat. They're neat to have, but not necessary. So this is a great tool just because then when you're putting foods into your jars, there's less spillage all over the place. There's less cleanup. Um, so it's handy, but certainly not necessary. 
um, a bubble tool, which I don't even, I do have one, but it's based, it's a chopstick. It's a chopstick that you pay for. All it is is making sure to be able to get your air bubbles out when you pack your food into the jars. Being able, or a knife, you could use a butter knife. Go around the edges, be able to bring out the air. It's kind of like, you know, when you're making cookies and you use a scoop of flour, use the knife to make sure that there isn't any air bubble stuck. Exact same thing. Um, a lid lifter, which is just a magnet, usually on the end of your bubble tool that lifts the lids up and sets them on top of your jar. I found that I end up touching the jars anyway, the lids. So you just make sure that your hands are always clean when touching them, but it literally just picks it up and moves it for you. It's not necessary if you wash your hands. Um, and then aside from that, if you're going to be making jellies and jams and you want to be able to measure the temperature so that you get that the proper thickness without pectin, having a thermometer, a candy thermometer, something like that works out really well. Again, very inexpensive online. Um, and you might have in your kitchen anyway. All right, so the big, I think the reason people get scared of water bath canning is because there's these like acid and pectin and words like that that make people uneasy. So the first thing with water bath canning and with all of this, again, if you follow your recipe, your acid is all set, so you do not actually have to know anything. But so you understand why it's important, having the acid in the recipe is what makes all of this safe. So if you follow your recipe, it has that pH of 4.6 or lower. Um, and so things like some berries um, and all of that, or even like, so tomatoes, for example, themselves do not have a low enough pH. So many times it's added in different ways, but I did like roasted tomatoes whole in my, for, um, in the oven and then put them into jars. And I had to put a, I don't know if it was a teaspoon or a tablespoon in the bottom of the jars first to bring down that acidity level. So that's why pickling things, you can pickle most anything because vinegar brings down your acidity level. So that's why people use vinegar and you can pickle anything, dills or squash or whatever it may be. And it's simply because you have vinegar as that vehicle that helps you bring down your acidity. So time, when you read a recipe and it tells you how long to can for, follow it. Um, if it says that it is for a pint jar and you are doing quart jars, find a recipe that has quart jars in it because you can't just double it. There's no specific amount of time that makes it appropriate to do the different size container. Um, so try to follow exactly what your recipe says or otherwise. Um, the time that's indicated, they want you to follow that because it's enough time for the full jar of food to be heated to the necessary temperature, not just the exterior. Just because the jar comes up to boiling does not mean that the interior of the food was able to be penetrated with the heat. And the heat is what knocks out a lot of the bad bacterias, um, things that cause botulism. So the heat and the time that is at that temperature is very important. And it means actually boiling. So if you put your jars in and your water stops boiling, bring it back up to your boil. It usually only takes a couple minutes, but start your timer then. The time it's active is only the actual boiling time. Oh, so then the other scary thing is pectin. Pectin is only necessary if you're using jams and jellies and you want to do the quicker method without having to wait a long time, use your, temp, uh, use your thermometer for your timing. Pectin is a naturally occurring agreement, uh, ingredient. It's um, found in apple skins, apple peels especially, um, and some really versed home canners will actually make their own pectin from apples. Just buy it for anyone who's not done this. I just buy it and it works out very well. Even things like, um, you can make your own vinegars at home. You can make all of those. If you're canning, using a shelf purchased item is much more safe because it's it's regulated to the acidity that's necessary. Um, so low pectin foods such as peaches, nectarines, strawberries, things like that, instead of having to do the long cooking method, you can utilize pectin and follow the recipes. Um, so I use two different kinds of pectin. Full sugar, when you want a ratio of roughly three cups of fruit to like seven cups of sugar. Real jam and jellies are very, very high in sugar. Um, so when you're doing something like that, you buy a pectin that is specifically for full sugar. And then if you want to do either low sugar, no sugar, things like that, you can specifically buy a pectin that is meant for that because pectin is activated within the sugar in your recipe. So no matter what you're using, um, you can find the pectin that's necessary for that. And like I said, you can also just cook it longer. Make sure you hit 220 degrees is the temperature that is needed to gel um, your foods, but that's it's for later. If you haven't canned yet, start with something like tomatoes and you'll, you'll get used to it and it'll be really easy. All right, so the actual process 
The biggest thing is just to make sure everything in your kitchen is clean. So have your counter, to anywhere you're going to be working, your countertops cleaned off. I always fully sanitize my sink so it's all set. Um, so I can, you know, clean all of my, um, my jars, wash my lids, my bands, everything like that. The other cheat that I do, because my kids are always touching everything and I don't trust them not to touch something when I'm not looking, I have a ton of just regular, like these towels. And instead of having to like wipe down my counter every time a jar bubbles over or like I'm messy and stuff, you know, goes over the side of it, I just switch out my towels because I would much rather just throw in a small load of laundry. So I utilize these, keep them on my counter, you know, load my jars on them, whatever it may be. If it spills over before my next batch, I just throw it in the washer or have my pile of dirty stuff. But that's one of my cheats um, is just the regular, I don't know, like dish towels, not the fuzzy ones because you don't want the fuzz. But these have been wonderful in making sure that everything is sanitary as I'm as I'm canning. But so you take your canner, which in this case is my big pot, um, fill it to capacity. So put your jars in um, that you're going to be, even if you're only going to be canning two jars, you should always put the number of jars in that fills your canner so that you're not tipping them over. If you only put two in and it's really rumbly and they happen to tip over, they could crack. So even if you only have three pints that are actually full, if you have empty jars, put those in because they'll keep everything nice and safe. Um, so it keeps them, like I said, it keeps them from tipping. And then, so you bring your water up to the full boil. You remove a jar from the canner. Doing this after you wash it them keeps, um, it helps sanitize them as well. So that's the, the reason for putting them in and it helps you get the appropriate water level. So you remove it from the canner, place it on the towel covered work surface, and then fill with either cold pack or hot pack foods, um, a quick, thing on that. Your recipe will always tell you if you're putting items in cold or if you're putting items in hot, depending on um, what what outcome you want. And we'll go over a couple recipes right at the end just as examples, but follow your recipe. Um, make sure you get all your bubbles released. So use your butter knife or chopstick or whatever it may be. And make sure that the top of your jar is clean. So after you put items in, even if you don't think you spilled anything, just pretend you did. Take either a, a damp cloth. I always use a, a paper towel because it's disposable and then I'm um, more likely to have it fully cleaned off. So do that, wipe the top of the jars so there's nothing at all that's impeding the lid to be able to um, suction down properly onto the jar. Um, the last thing, and so you'll see um, in canning videos and things like that, a lot of times they say to boil the lids or um, have different methods. Whatever canning lids you buy, so I have two different ones here. So for my regular my mouth jars, just different brands, it was the different ones that were on sale at the time. Read the instructions. Even these have instructions on the back to help make it foolproof. Because of technology, it's very rare that your lids will say that they need to be boiled anymore. Having the hot soapy water warms them up enough that there's no other step that needs to be taken care of. So if you're watching a canning video online and it says to boil your lids, if your lids don't say that, don't do it because they're set up so that you don't need to do that. So just follow the directions on your um, on these. And then after set on the top of your jar, ever so carefully, as I said, you can use the jar lifter or simply touch the outside. Don't be grabbing it like this to put on your jar, but set it on top and then you put your screw band on. Again, these can be used. Set them on and it's just to hand tighten. So don't Crank it like crazy, don't leave it loose, put it on to hand tighten like you would put something in the refrigerator and you're good to go. Um, so then you use your tongs, submerge the jars once they're all filled. So prep all of your jars, submerge them. Um, make sure they are covered with that two inches of water. Bring them back to the boil. Let them can for however long it is. After that's all set, turn off, your, uh, turn off the boiling. Let them rest for five minutes and then go ahead and take them out and set them set them down. The biggest thing, and it's so tempting, when you're taking the jars out, because of the way that they dip down, there's gonna be water on top. Do not tip the jars, because it can mess with the, um, with the seal process. So bring them straight out, resist the temptation, just set them down, you lost a little bit of water, it's completely fine, it's, it's all right. But so that's one of the biggest things um, where things can go wrong in your vacuum seal as well. So just be as gentle with them as possible. Do not disturb them. And then as they are, oh, it says popping. You'll hear popping. You'll hear popping as they are, um, as they're starting to seal. So you bring them out of the heat. They're coming to room temperature. That vacuum is occurring. And then you'll start hearing that noise from wherever you are in the house. So they lose their spring and that's how you know. 
Um, don't touch them right away. Let them sit. You touching them isn't going to guarantee it's going to happen anyway. So let them be. And it is what it is. Um, if you're really comfortable with regular water bath canning, you can also do pressure canning. So the reason you would pressure can, this will be very brief because um, it's a little more advanced, but is for foods that are not a low pH. Pressure canning, uh, because of the pressure inside of it, the heat can get much higher and it can cook your foods at a higher temperature. So regular water bath canning um, can kill the, what is, there's two parts of it. Um, the, it's sorry, the spores. So the, um, the spores of botulism, what causes botulism, which is why many people are scared of canning. Although the rest of it will be killed by regular water bath canning, the spores can survive. However, in pressure canning, the heat that is built up with inside of it actually kills the spores of the bacteria that causes botulism as well. So if you're canning things that are low acid like carrots or green beans, um, meats and things like that, pressure canning is necessary um, to do so and your recipe will tell you. There are definitely foods that should not be done at all. So even um, like pumpkin is not recommended as something for the home canner to have like a ready to go pumpkin puree. Um, so there are items that are recommended not to do any canning within a home kitchen, but pressure canning um, opens a lot of other, other avenues if you end up going that direction. So canning in general, so headspace, your recipe will always tell you how much space needs to be between your food and the top of the jar. And the reason that that is important is because the amount of um, air that's there works with the acidity and the foods within the jar to create that proper vacuum, so always stick to that. Altitude, if you happen to be somewhere else, I think altitude at my house is around 400. Where are we here? Yeah, 1,000 feet. So, so over 1,000 feet, so that might be an area where you might want to make sure exactly where you are. Anything over 1,000 feet, there's different levels where you would increase the time that, you are, um, that you're canning your products. So there's a regular, like if you look up canning altitude uh, adjustments, you can find that, but it normally adds five, 10 minutes, something like that. Nothing big other than adding a little bit of time just to be careful because it changes your air pressure. Um, the last thing is just knowing that you are using non-reactive cookware where your food is actually being touched. So your actual canning contraption can be made of most anything, but if you are making jams and jellies or you're making your sauce before it goes into your jars using non-reactive cookware, so stainless steel, glass, ceramic, um, or something that's coated in that is necessary. And just the reason is because if you're using acidic foods, tomatoes, um, things that have the lemon juice and vinegar, aluminum, copper, iron, and non-stainless steel um, are reactive. So the surfaces release atoms that give the, it's like a tinny taste. You can taste it if you don't, um, if you don't use something that's non-reactive when you're using acidic foods. So again, that's just for the actual making the jam or jellies. Um, so not for the canning thing itself, but if your recipe specifically mentions non-reactive cookware, that's all it means. Make sure, like I use my Dutch oven a lot because it's ceramic coated. So that's usually my go-to for actually making sauce or jams. Um, how you know things went good or bad? The good thing is simply that your lid is gonna pop down. Next day, so if you let these sit overnight, you can take your screw band off and you should be able to not pull it off completely but mess with this a little bit. So bring it up just a bit with your fingernail, a little bit of pressure and it shouldn't come off. That's how you know you have a good seal around the full jar. If only a tiny bit of pressure pops it up, it was gonna happen anyway in your cellar because there's pressure within the jar and it was going to make a mess. So you're welcome to do that just to make sure that the lid is down and that your seal is on tight. The bad things to look for, fizzing, bubbling, swelling, if it smells bad, if you see mold. And again, this is for canning. If you were lacto-fermenting things, a little bit of mold in that on the top is normal. But for canning itself, you don't wanna see anything weird. If it smells weird, you think it might taste weird, don't test it to see if it tastes weird because then it's already too late, don't do it. So if you're, if you're unsure, just leave it be. Um, and I wanted to make a note just because this is um, a focus on uh, health and food safety. Even still today, the CDC recommends that if you're using ham, home canned tomatoes, so sauces, anything like that, before you consume them after they were canned, that you're supposed to recook them before you use them. So just a note, whether you choose to or not, but that's just a current recommendation from the CDC because tomatoes are such a low acid food and they are traditionally water bath canned if you don't get the acid just right. It's something that kind of is right on that on that line. So a good thing to know. Um, so I don't know, in closing, 
just try any of it. The biggest thing, like I said, so I really like freezing because it's easy and simple. Um, I actually, I didn't grow up canning or preserving or doing any of this. I grew up in Minnesota and we did like a lot of tater tot hot dish and things like that, but actually preserving other than freezing corn. We did a lot of freezing corn because um, my grandfather grew sweet corn, um, but that was about it for freezing and canning. So I learned all of this, I mean, over 10 years ago, but was self-taught, got the books, tried a couple things, did a couple workshops, and then found people that wanted to try it with me. So I got a big bunch of peaches and had a friend like come and try it and we laughed and had fun. So having someone to do it with is always fun. Um, if you're trying to make a jam or a jelly and the recipe, you know, has you make it get to the right temperature, you follow everything, and then it doesn't set, there's nothing wrong with it. As long as the seal is right, the food's just fine, it's just different. It might not be a jam or a jelly, maybe you suddenly have compote. Like this last week I made plum compote because it did not set right. Um, and I don't know for sure what it was, but it didn't, so I have four jars that are a little liquidy and we'll just either, when I take them out, I'll go ahead and cook them down again, or we'll put them on pancakes and things like that. Um, but yeah, just don't, don't be afraid to try any new things. I have some examples and things up here. So for example, like I brought my food miller. Um, another thing, if you haven't canned before and you're not, or even for blanching, if you don't think that your hands can take it, if you don't deal with hot foods a lot, uh, like I have a pair of these for my daughter, if she's handling any of the foods, just putting a layer between you and the food helps out. So there's little tips and tricks like that. Um, having the kitchen aid with attachments is wonderful, but um, a mandolin for you know slicing things evenly. Like I said, the food mill so that you can easily get peels and, um, and the cores out of your apples. All conveniences, but not necessary. You can easily also just hand peel an apple and take out the core. Um, and I have some of the tomatoes that I had frozen if you want to see what it's like when the peel comes off. I have a couple of the um, peaches that I blanched earlier today just in case you have interest in, if you've never blanched something and are you know, interested in that. And then just some basic recipes up here as examples. So some of my favorite things, I love using a slow cooker to make fruit butter, which is not butter at all, but it just cooks down the fruit even more for a longer period of time. Um, that it, it, it intensifies the sweetness and it's again, hands off. I love the hands off stuff. So like overnight using my crock pots to do um, pear butter. Um, apple scrap jelly, so I really love jams. I'm not a big jelly person because it just it like kills me inside to throw away. Fruit. So the reason, the difference between jams and jellies is that jams have the fruit in them. Jellies are the lick, the fruit lick, fruit sugar liquid that are strained from fruit. So like this is an example. The jelly I will make is apple scrap jelly because if I core and peel my apples for whatever it is that I'm making, I save those items, mix it with sugar and lemon juice, cook it down, and then strain out the liquid, and that's what ends up making the jelly. So um, apple scrap jelly is one that I really, really like, but that's why jellies are always clear. It's because there's no um, actual fruit left within them. But so jellies, and then tomatoes. Um, I like making not sauce with tomatoes. So bruschetta is, oh, my photo didn't come up. That's all right. Bruschetta is one of my favorite things to make takes quite a bit more ingredients, but this um, is an example of a, what they call a cold pack. So the tomatoes I'm putting into the jars are not processed, not cooked at all. I'm just pouring a brine over them that's going to change the, um, the product itself. So you, you know put together all of the items, the cloves, the vinegar, the dry white wine, water, all of that, um, bring it to a rolling boil, and then end up putting it over your tomatoes. So you chop up your tomatoes, put them in, leave that headspace. Um, and then you're able to can it as normal, like because it's tomatoes, they're a little lower acid. You'll usually see a longer canning time on that, so 20 minutes. Um, and then I have bruschetta, which is a wonderful thing in the middle of the summer. But anyway, so there's recipes, ideas. I have books. Like I said, I have about 15 books out from the library now, so if you were looking for them, I have them. Uh, but they'll be going back and are a wonderful resource. Um, and I have handouts as well. And I think that's it. Uh, does anyone have a question? Yes. It was a lot. Yes, go ahead. I, I uh, would like to ask you about uh, uh, steam canning. Yes. And it, now we did steam canning for years, and it's always seemed to be the way to go. And we never, we never even, we had a, a bath, but we never used it. Yeah. Um, what would you, what, as a food safety situation, how do you feel about it? What are some things you'd use in it? What things wouldn't you use in it? Yeah, so for actual canning itself, I've never steam canned because it isn't, it is no longer a recommended method. 
water bath and pressure canning are the two methods, you know, through between the different departments, but FDA, USDA, all of that. These are the only two methods they use. So even other things like um, hot packing jars and have you ever flipped jars over? Like, have you ever heard of that? So putting hot food into the hot jars, putting the lid on, flipping them over while they're boiling hot. You were supposed to do that and then wait until they cooled down and flip them back over and it like, it would do the vacuum. So there's all sorts of things like that that have been done that they say no more any longer. So the two methods that are um, allowed are this, even like people have instant pots now, I'm sure everyone has an instant pot. Um, the new versions are coming out with like what they're calling a canning setting and the USDA has said, we don't, no, don't do it. Um, just because it's it's not regulated the same, it isn't it isn't able to do that. So these are truly these are only the only two I've done. I've never steam canned because it's no longer one of the like one of the two ways. Like even in all the recipe books I have, it's either water bath or pressure depending on the depending on the food. Yes.